Hey, this is Crypto Wealth. Today, I'm excited for the interview that we have. We have uh, the, I guess, is founder, dev, CEO? What, what's the proper title there? Yeah, co-founder. Co-founder, -co co-visionary <laughs> <laughs> um, for, uh, for Base Protocol. So we're going to be getting started. I've got an interview here for the next little while. I'm excited to find out more about this project. Obviously, I know a little bit about the project. Full disclosure, I, I do have a small stake in this project overall. Um, I'm excited about what they're doing, and I'm still learning about it. Like I, I, I learned one or two things about it, and it was enough for me to jump in with a small amount. Um, but this is going to be going live, what, next week? I'll be posting this the week of the night, so it'll be the next week, right? Well, tar uh, yeah, targeting listing right around middle November. I we we do have a specific date in mind, but we're just waiting a little bit because um, we've got some kind of strategic partnerships and announcements lined up that we want to make sure are timed properly so that we you know kind of get the right attention around the project. But listing, we're looking at middle November. All right, that's incredible. So let's get started. <clears throat> uh, and your name is Nick, right? Nick, all right, and Nick, and if you go in the Telegram, by the way, you see Nick in the Telegram for uh, Base Protocol, and uh, and quickly here, I'm gonna see if I can. Here's their website. We'll be talking about this website a little bit, but it's baseprotocol.org. Uh, Nick, if you would, let's just get started. I want to talk about some stuff. Uh, I want to first start off with just uh, some basics of Base. Then I want to talk about kind of what got you to this point where you were involved with it. And, uh, and your ideas for the future, et cetera. And we'll just kind of let it flow, but I'll have a lot of questions for you. So first things first, just an introduction about what is Base Protocol. Sure. Uh, Base Protocol um, and its token, Base, is a token whose price is pegged to the total market cap of all cryptocurrencies. So by pegging price to the total market cap of all cryptocurrencies basically allows Base holders to speculate on the entire crypto industry by just holding base. So base essentially acts as like an S&P 500, but for the crypto industry, which is giving you that kind of like diverse hedged exposure to performance of the entire industry rather than just holding Bitcoin or some specific portfolio of, you know, cryptos that you've chosen. Um, you can kind of use this to just say, to just take the guesswork out and speculate on the entire industry. So the the idea is it's like the index fund for for coin market cap essentially. Exactly. Okay, that's the hope. That's the idea. But it's a it's a rebased token, very simple to very similar to the way Ample was. But Ample is based on it's, it's trying to peg to the U.S. dollar, right? Yeah. So Ampleforth is basically pegging to the U.S. dollar. They're actually pegging to CPI, so it's technically like an inflation adjusted dollar, which is their key differentiation. But as to put it simply, Ampleforth is basically pegging to a dollar. And Ampleforth was kind of the uh, pioneer for this peg token because they created this elastic supply and rebasing protocol, which is what allows you to achieve the price peg. And so base protocol also uses the same kind of elastic supply protocol, which uses rebasing which is how a price peg is fixed. Okay. So well, this um, is starting to sound complicated. So the, the thing that I struggle with most, and I, I want to see if we can explain this to the audience and I may let you explain it first and then I may try to explain it. And, and, and quite yeah. honestly, I don't know that I can explain this perfectly, but the, the thing that we need to explain to make certain that the audience understands is what rebasing is. So let me just say this, first of all, typically in cryptocurrency, things are inflation or deflationary. Typically um, you can primarily it's inflationary, Bitcoin, for example, has a limited supply, but you know more Bitcoins are mined all the time, so that's increasing the supply. That's what we mean by inflation. Deflation is when a token is burned or there's been deflationary projects out there, that sort of thing. With a rebase token, it's both inflationary and deflationary, but can you? Ex but it's pegged to a certain value. So, can you kind of explain a little bit about how the value works? Yeah, definitely. So. The easiest way I can kind of explain rebasing is just sort of with an example. So let's say that you have a token and its whole mission is to be pegged to $1. This token needs to be trading at $1. If it's trading at $1, perfect, it's at equilibrium. That's its target, It's to always be trading at $1. Now, let's say that for whatever reason, there's crazy market activity and that peg is disrupted. So it's trading at $1, but now a bunch of people buy it up so it goes up to two dollars 
In this case, it's no longer pegged to a dollar. And remember, that was the whole point. The whole mission is for each one of these tokens to be worth a dollar. So now it's worth two dollars. What a rebasing protocol is going to do is take that one token, which is worth two dollars, and it's going to actually multiply the total token supply across the board. So now instead of holding one token valued at two dollars, you're now going to have two tokens each valued at one dollar. So what the protocol does is it basically changes supply to meet that target price. Because by changing supply, you affect scarcity. And by affecting scarcity, you're naturally going to influence price. So you have one token. It's worth $1, but then it goes up to $2. What the protocol is going to do is it's then going to adjust supply. In this case, it's going to expand the supply. So now instead of having one token at $2, you'll have two tokens at $1, and the price peg is re-achieved. So that's basically how, um, how Ampleforth achieves its price peg and how BASE is going to achieve its price peg. So in the case of BASE, it's pegged to the total crypto market cap at a ratio of 1 to 1 trillion. I know it sounds a little complicated, but all it means is that if crypto market cap is $400 billion, then BASE target price is 40 cents. Crypto market cap is 800 billion, BASE should be 80 cents. And if crypto market cap reaches 1 trillion, BASE will be $1. So right now, at this very moment, at the time of this video that we're recording this, coin market cap is... 426 billion so base would be priced at 42 cents yeah and this is actually a really good opportunity for me to uh, show you guys something um, give me one second let me so, explain it, uh, let me explain it this way hang on a second Nick let me explain it this way as yeah. well um, I just had that up on my screen but that's okay um, let me explain it to you another way as well those of you that are familiar with stocks all rebasing is essentially is like a stock split yeah. So, it, and it happens every day in your case, correct, Nick? It can happen once every 24 hours. Okay. So rebasing with base protocol, and it depends on which rebasing project you're looking at. But in this case, with base protocol, it happens at least once every 24 hours. Now, when it happens, again, let's use the example of $2 or well, not not to be confusing, but look at coin market cap. Right now, coin market cap is point, uh, the price would be, 0.42 cents per base based on the current price of the coin market cap. So if all of a sudden with sometime within 24 hours, if enough people are buying, cause they like, I like this idea, I like having a piece of the whole pie, so to speak. I like have on an index type project of the whole coin market cap. Then when they buy it within 24 hours, supply and demand happens. So there's a limited supply within that 24 hour period. People buy it up. All of a sudden it's 84 cents. That means when rebasing occurs, you're going to end up with two tokens at 42 cents. The inverse is also true. If it's kind of like a, a little bit like a stock buyback, if all of a sudden the price starts dropping and right now coin market cap says that the token should be 0.4, you know, 42 cents. But if for some reason it's trading or selling because someone's you know, maybe dumped their position or whatever, and if it's trading hypothetically at 21 cents, then if that were to happen, what would happen is there would be less supply. The rebasing would basically, for lack of better terms, burns or removes tokens. So now instead of having two tokens worth 21 cents, you're going to have one token worth 42 cents. And this is important for people to understand because a lot of people don't realize this when it comes to rebasing. That is that you actually lose the number of, you keep the value, but in your actual wallet where you're holding the tokens, like... This is great, right, Nick? You end up with more or less tokens. Like your actual number of tokens will change, but the value of those tokens, the total value of those tokens is going to stay around the same value. Uh, in this case, the coin market cap. Is that correct? Exactly. Okay. So again, if you ever decide to get started with the base protocol, and we're going to show you at the end of this video, there's several ways you can profit with this project. It's really interesting. Um, I mean, this project offers, of any one single project, what makes it so unique is not only having a piece of the total market cap and a little bit of the diversity that exists there, but it's the number of ways or the different strategies that someone could use to be able to profit from this project. We'll talk about that a little bit later towards the end of the video. And Nick may even have other ideas that I haven't thought about. But let me just say this. you will. It's important to understand within a 24-hour period at a certain time, what is that time, Nick, that rebasing will eight, occur? 
8 p.m. <clears throat> Excuse me. 8 p.m. UTC. Okay. 8 p.m. UTC time, which would be what? Central time, U.S. Just for those that are in the uh, U.S. I don't know. Let me find out. And I'm actually Central time, U.S., so I should know this. No, you should know that. He doesn't even know what his own project is going to rebase. <laughs> That's 2 p.m. Central time, Okay. United States. So two p every day around 2 p.m., it should rebase to where your holdings of base protocol tokens is going to be pegged to whatever the current market cap is. Now, with that being said, that market cap is going to go up or down, so it doesn't mean that you're going to have the exact same amount. Obviously, it just depends on what the coin market cap is. But from this month to next month, you may have a lot more or a lot less tokens. But every day right around, you know, Two or whatever, it's going to rebasing is going to occur. Which actually, that's the chance to make money is when rebasing occurs. But at some point, when it uh, at some point throughout the day, you should be pretty close to the current coin market cap. In theory, that's the theory. Now it can wildly adjust, go, the price can move up and down, and that's a chance to be able to make profit. But in theory, that's how it should work. Am I correct on that so far, Nick? Yeah, the best way that I can kind of explain this is understanding that there is kind of a formative period for a rebase token. And then like an end state. And this is really analogous to almost any crypto project. So but before I kind of explain it with how it works for base protocol, I'll just say, if you look at, for example, Bitcoin, when Bitcoin was first emerging in 2012 and 2013, there's a formative period, right? Where a lot of people are excited and they're speculating on Bitcoin itself to become this universally accepted digital currency. But in the beginning, there weren't that many people actually using Bitcoin. There wasn't very much adoption. So trading is much more speculative and volatile and the utility of Bitcoin as an actual you know, means for transactions wasn't very high. However, over the course of adoption, as we see more and more people buying and using Bitcoin, you see more and more and more utility. And eventually at some point, right, if, if we really expect that Bitcoin will take over fiat currencies in the way that we hope it will, not if there's going to be if. a right <laughs> there's going to be there's going to be a stabilization period where bitcoin will no longer be necessarily a volatile asset but on the way there there is volatility and this is where people speculate and profit and things like that um the same kind of goes for a rebase token now i'm not here to create any expectation of profit or speculate on the performance of base as it enters the market but i will explain how rebase tokens in general work what we saw with Ampleforth, and maybe give you guys some, I guess, thought, thought, things to think about um, as you're kind of looking over base protocol. Yeah, so, you show us, show us, explain, I want you to explain this, show us that. I want to move into some more of the, uh, after that, I want to move into some more of the fundamentals of the project as far as purposes, why, how, that sort of stuff uh, in general, Yeah. kind of the fundamental type stuff. And then at the end, I'll go through some strategies that I'm aware of, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, because I want to make certain I know this, on mm. how those of us as investors could earn profit. And he's right. We're not going to give you any expectations. I can't give you any expectations. But what are some things to look for? For What are opportunities to look for, essentially? Um, so sure. go ahead. Finish what you were going to go into. Sure. So the end goal for BASE is for it to be stably pegged to crypto market cap, right? Which means that it'll only really, its price should only really follow <clears throat> the price performance of the total crypto industry. Now, a common misconception for BASE is that that's as quickly as it can grow. However, that's not the case. If that was the case, people wouldn't have made, I guess, the, the money or the success that they did with Ampleforth. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because Ampleforth is pegged to essentially a dollar. However, as adoption for Ampleforth occurred, you saw a bunch of people disrupting that dollar peg. So even though Ampleforth is supposed to be pegged to $1, you saw it trading as high as $2 and $3 and $4 because people were buying it up. And what happened as people were disrupting that peg? Well, when Ampleforth is trading at $2 and $3 and $4, they're having these positive rebases where they're expanding supply for everyone. So everyone holding Ample is getting bonus Ample tokens in their wallet in addition to the price performance that Ample was seeing. So the point is, as Ampleforth adoption was happening, you saw a lot of the runaway profits, the money game that was being made on Ampleforth. And then as Ampleforth reached a kind of popular adoption threshold, you saw it start to stable out. 
Now, over these past couple weeks, we've seen Ample trading in a healthy range between $0.90 cents and $1.10. And their goal is to really get more towards $0.99 cents and $1.01, right? So base protocol, again, I'm not speculating on performance or how base is going to um, perform once it's on the market. But the ultimate thing that I'm trying to say here is that in the adoption phase, base is going to experience volatility. The price peg will not be perfect. Crypto market cap might be $400 billion and base might be trading at $0.80 cents or $0.25. Cents. I don't know. But the peg will not be perfect in the beginning. The beginning period is kind of the speculative period where new adopters are coming in and buying base to use it as the crypto index. But once that adoption slows down and we reach a more final state, that's where you'll start to see the good correlation with total crypto market cap. So it's important to understand that the, even though the mission for base is to peg to total crypto market cap, in the beginning, that's not going to happen, and there is going to be some volatility. It will be higher risk and reward for early adopters. So Nick, but here's the thing. Like I hear you talk about, and and I did, I saw you do another interview. He, Nick did an interview with Box Mining, uh, and you guys should go check out Box Mining's channel. Go subscribe to his channel. Puts up great content, particularly related to the Asian markets. Probably the best uh, YouTuber when it comes to talking about things that's happening in the Asian markets. And I'll put that video. I'll put it on my end screen or whatever. You can watch it. It's a great, great interview that covers different types of topics. But in 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 there, and, and Nick did a good job of explaining some topics in there. So, but. One of the things that you guys kept talking about was this concept here. You were talking about it's going to become basically a better or a more efficient peg with time. But what's what I'm realizing as you're talking, though, it's really the reason it's going to be inefficient is because of less users. The more users using it or we may see par periods of inefficiency. So I correct me if I'm wrong. So what I see is really the stability of users. So if users it's going to need a certain number of users. Okay, let me back up. Ladies and gentlemen, let me just say this. One of the areas that you can make a tremendous amount of profit on this is because there's not going to be enough users to keep the price efficient. In any in any place, here's an advanced investing tip. And in, of all the money in, in real estate, for example, you make money in real estate when you fix other people's problems. You you make money in in base because there's not enough people who yet understand how to make money in base. Do you follow me? So what happens is there will be obvious times that the price is going to be really high. And in theory, you're probably going to want to consider selling then because at some point through rebasing, the hope is that they pull the price. They will pull the price down eventually. Um, the, right. But the flip side of it is if the <coughs> price goes really, really low, you might want to be buying at least a little bit because ultimately, if not through market conditions, through rebasing, the price is going to be pulled back up. So that's how you can speculate. That's one way. I'm giving it to you right now. That's one way you want to be looking out for. Now, I want to understand this because I want to understand the greater project. And by the way, that's only that sort of thing that I just real, go ahead. Real quick, well, here let, let me cut in cuz you're you're touching on a really good point there. So, I, earlier you guys remember, you know, I, I had my fingers all out here and I was talking about um where we have one token supposed to be valued at $1, but then it goes up to $2. And so a rebase happens, which instead of making it one token valued at $2, becomes two tokens each valued at $1. That's the point of rebasing. However, it doesn't happen so perfectly like that because the protocol, the rebase protocol, it can affect supply. However, it can't directly change price. The market has to do that. So <clears throat> let's talk, paint that scenario again. Great point, by you the way. You have one token. Yeah, you have one token valued at $1, and it's supposed to peg to $1, but its price goes up to $2. This moment you have one token valued at $2. So the rebase is going to multiply supply to hopefully influence the price to come down. So the rebase hits, and now, at the moment the rebase hits, you have two tokens. But the moment the rebase happens, you actually have two tokens each valued at $2 still. Good point. So your balance has gone from $1 to $2, and following the rebase, your total balance is now $4. This is where you'll have an incentive to sell that bonus token for that $2 high rate. Probably keep this one or maybe sell all of them. But this is where everyone in the market is going to be rushing to sell immediately following the rebase because they've got these bonus tokens at this premium price 
So they're all going to rush to sell, and that's how the rebase actually drives price down. And the same on the contrary, right? In the case of a negative rebase, if a negative rebase happens, immediately following that, users can now buy a greater percentage of the base network for a cheaper price than they could have before the rebase, which is their incentive to then buy. This is what's actually driving the price changes. And, you know, as, you know, Crypto Wealth was talking about, these are the arbitrage opportunities. And I don't want to call it a profit opportunity, but it's the trading opportunity, right, that you guys can identify on top of just um, speculating on base if that's what you're doing. But it's a speculative yeah, opportunity it, for sure. Right. It's, it, it has to. And here's what blew my mind when I was first learning about base, because I, I was vaguely aware and I had trouble understanding rebasing at first with Ampleforth. And I, I just couldn't understand why people were buying this up, buying this up. But one of the reasons people buy it up in the beginning is because it's it's further speculation. It's basically high risk, higher risk. Crypto is already high risk. A new project's very high risk. Continuing to buy a project that you know has some tokenomics that should adjust the price opposite of what you're trying to do is extraordinarily high risk. <laughs> But yeah. people did well with there are some people who did very well with Ampleforth because it went up. How high did Ampleforth go at the peak? In market cap, I think close to seven hundred billion. What was the price? Because it was uh, trying to peg a it's, dollar. Its highest price was like four dollars. So think, I mean, that's just nuts if you think about it. <laughs> it is, you know, it actually but, is you're, because you're, keep in mind, it wasn't just four dollars. They were getting more tokens that were still valued higher and higher. The rebasing. The rebasing was working. The market shift wasn't working yet. It took it a minute to catch in, and that's just because of inefficiency yeah. in the market. Uh, there wasn't exactly. enough. There and, and there wasn't enough players quick. over yeah. time. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off, but just to correct myself, it was just a bit above 600 billion at its height, or 600 million at its height. Sorry. Right. I understand that market cap's important, but yep. most people are going to look at price. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I fully get that. By the way, um, the uh, so for the audience, price is extremely important. Um, but it, it's just fascinating to even think about. Now, I will tell you, the smaller player you are in base, I wasn't even going to go here this soon, but I'll go ahead and mention it. Your opportunities are going to be, it's high risk, high risk, high risk. So you probably shouldn't do it, but it's high risk. So the, the opportunities for smaller players is going to be before this thing starts hitting mass adoption. Because when the whales come in, they can move so much at a time that it quickly can adjust the price. And for them, it's okay because if they make, you know, 3%, 5% on a big position, they're okay with that. Um, where in theory, by the time we get, you know, the hopefully we get to mass adoption. If they can make 3% or 5%, your arbitrage opportunities, it's going to be harder for the small guy or the small fish, so to speak, um, when it gets bigger. But there are other ways to be able to make money with base that are, um, keep in mind, it's an S&P 500 version of the coin market cap, essentially. So if you believe in crypto, hold base. Let's talk about this for a moment because what makes base unique, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, it's the only project, <coughs> the only thing that I've seen out there. Um, and and is it the, is, this is basically a smart contract, correct? Yeah. Okay. By the way, a lot of my audience knows what a smart contract is. So this is basically a smart contract. That That's how this functions. ERC20 mm -hmm. token, right? <coughs> yeah. On Ethereum. So here's what's, so you can use Uniswap, ladies and gentlemen, when the time comes. Um, so here's here's what's interesting though. This is decentralization at its core, and that's what I love about this. There's there's very few projects. I know you have to rely on pricing oracles and whatnot. Where do you pull your prices from? So we pull prices from here. Give me just a second. I can actually show you here. Um, present now from tab. I got another question I want to ask you real quick. When a rebase occurs, is it a, is it like a 100% rebase? Meaning, we were talking about earlier, $1 <coughs> becoming $2. Does it, when it rebases, does it rebase 100% to, okay, for example, if we're trying to, in this, for example's sake, we're trying to peg to a dollar, but the token's at $2. When it rebases, does it a hundred rebase to a full two tokens? Or does it do like some percentage? Full rebase. So, you're actually asking a good question. Now, we're getting... It's a little technical, but it is an important thing to talk about. Um, there's different factors that come into play for a rebase token, right? Like, how often are you rebasing? Is it once every 24 hours, once every 12 hours, once every four hours? Uh, and then, like you're talking about, how are you distributing supply adjustments? Is that graded over time? Is it happening all at once? How many days is it graded over? Over what percentage, right? All of those factors 
are going to be governed by the community. So base is a governance token where the community can make proposals to say, hey, we actually want to see a little bit more stability in the rebase supply distributions, and they can propose a vote on, say, changing the supply distribution to happen equally over a period of five days. Wait a minute. I days. somehow missed that. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold up. Yeah. So it's not just about the token and pegging to coin market cap, but it's also a governance token. So there's a kind of a dual use case here. Yes. That's freaking smart. All right, keep going. Yeah, it's great because, you know, whenever we were, I mean, making this, we were kind of thinking about all those factors, right? We were like, should we do the rebase every 24 hours? Maybe it would be really cool if it rebased every two hours. So it's really, you know, fine grained. <clears throat> and we started talking about the supply smoothing. We noticed that Ampleforth did do their, uh, their rebases over a 10-day period, with uh, uh, an equal percentage occurring every day. And we were trying to figure out how to do this, and we ultimately decided the best thing would be to just leave it in the community's hands. Um, and in the beginning, we're starting with 24-hour rebases, and the rebase issuance is happening 100% instantaneously. That's kind of that like highly rewarding volatility that we want in the beginning mm -hmm. to attract yes. the participants. And then what we expect to see is that as the token starts to stable out and reach a more stable peg in its more like end state, that we'll start to see the community start to propose those more stable parameters on the rebasing, right? So it's going to trend organically in whichever direction the community wants it to go. That's actually but, brilliant, though, for a lot of reasons. I mean, I don't even have to tell you all the future potential ramifications with regulations, et cetera, et cetera. That makes it really, yeah. really smart. The more decentralized, less centralized governance you can have, the better off you're going to be long term. Um, meaning meaning it's not an issue today, but you know how the, the government can always I always talk about my channel, how government can always go backwards and almost penalize you for something that wasn't illegal at the time or whatever. Um, yeah. So, so in, I want to say this real quick. So the... The idea, ultimately, I can see how the community long term, and some of you are degenerates and you're always looking for that, you know, one penny altcoin that's going to go to like a million dollars. I get that. You know, I get it. All of us would do that if we had a crystal ball. So there, I, I, it's interesting that you say we're looking to attract those, those potentially high speculation, high profit type players, movers, because there, there is going to, listen, there is a strong possibility that there are going to be some good profit opportunities, regardless of what the long-term outcome look at this, just based on the rebasing mechanism alone. Any That's just logical. That means there are high-risk moves, but could be profitable. So you got to be aware of that. But long-term, the idea, people who are holding a lot of this in the long run, guys who have, you know, a thousand dollars worth, one day a million dollars worth or whatever, you don't want to see big price swings throughout the day. You want to see that thing stay super stable, as stable as possible. So I can see the governance right. looking for more often, uh, looking for to rebase more often. It's really fascinating that you that you mentioned that. Um, all right, let's just see what you're going to show us. Yeah, going back to your point, where are we sourcing <clears throat> crypto market cap from? So right now we've independently integrated a Chainlink Oracle, which is feeding uh, crypto market cap from eleven different sources. You know, Coin Gecko, Coin Market Cap, Trading View, most of the popular ones, and it's then grabbing the median market cap from all of those sources, which is what basically makes it spoof-proof. So that if theoretically any one uh, source was compromised, either through a hack or just a, a system failure, we've still got several other sources. And the only way to truly spoof this data would be for six different market cap sources to conspire together and say that crypto market cap is $2 trillion or something, which we consider a highly unlikely scenario. So the data is very resilient. It's very secure. Um, and that's how we're grabbing market cap. So the, I'm glad you point that out because someone like Richard Hartz of the world loves to talk about how the downfall is oracles. Now you're, the, your, your pricing that you're pulling also makes it a little bit spoof proof. I mean, you're pulling a broad market pricing. You're not pulling something like, you know, the price of Ethereum, for example, or the price of Bitcoin. You're pulling a broad market. Right. So that also makes this a little more spoof proof, so to speak, as you said, I like that term. Um, yeah. Now, let me ask you this. So is your median, how is a median being determined? Is that part of the smart contract? Uh, yeah, well, it's part of the Chainlink Oracle contract, yeah. I uh, gotcha, okay. Um, okay, I appreciate you explaining that to me. So have you guys, has, have you guys been audited? We just finished 
the audit on our token contract with uh, Halborn. Um, we'll have the report for that releasing probably in a couple days. It'll, it'll probably be released by the time this video uh, comes out. But there's two sides to our contract audit. One is for the token contract, and the other one is for the cascade. Now, let me explain the cascade to everyone yeah, please do. real quick. Um, basically, you know, I'm sure you guys are familiar with staking and APYs, especially if you're on Uniswap. Uh, basic premise is that you go to an exchange like Uniswap, you stake tokens, for example, base, which in doing that, you're providing liquidity into a Uniswap liquidity pool. So by staking base, there's now tokens for people to transact with on Uniswap. And by doing that, you're rewarded with a percentage of the transaction fees, right? So that's right. how you're kind of generating a return for providing liquidity on Uniswap. Now, what BASE does in addition to that is if you've provided liquidity on Uniswap, Uniswap gives you back your liquidity provider token. You can then stake that token on the Cascade, which is on the BASE protocol site. And let me just go ahead and show yeah, that to you guys right now. I actually pulled up, but go ahead. Um, sure. Okay, cool. So uh, if, you, if you stake in the Cascade, you'll get an additional second layer of rewards. This uh, is a lot like Ampleforth's Geyser, if any of you guys are familiar with that. However, Ampleforth's Geyser is a one-off event. The rewards pool within their Geyser is just funded with some large sum, and once it's depleted, it's depleted, and they might have another you know, Geyser event or not, but they've got to come up with the funds somewhere. In the case of base, the way that that cascade is sustained is through rebases. So just going to explain this real quick. Imagine there's a 20% rebase that's going to happen. In other words, a 20% supply expansion. Base takes 10% of that supply expansion and then uses it to replenish the cascade rewards pool. So if there's going to be a 20% supply expansion, an extra 2% of tokens would be minted. And those tokens would mostly go into the cascade rewards pool. And that's how that Cascade Rewards Pool sustains itself and rewards everyone who is staking base on Uniswap. Stop right there for a minute. So, Stop right there. I want to say something. Don't lose your train of thought. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an example. In crypto, it is not true to say that a quote-unquote clone isn't better. Make no mistake about it. This is an open source project, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They'll have competitions. They got this idea from Ampleforth. The base code originally came from Ampleforth, probably some tweaks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the way he just explained right there is why it's better. Like that is freaking brilliant. Like you're, I did not know this. I'm sitting here watching you say this and I'm like, oh shit. That's so, that's such a good idea to make in the beginning. All this stuff is always profitable in the earth is higher risk, but it's more profitable in the beginning stages. But here's the thing, what it does long term, it creates a level of efficiency. And that's what you want in a project long term. Pump and dump dies, but you want ultimately to have price stability and efficiency among the users. And this helps create a certain level of efficiency. And it's another, it's one of the things on my channel, I always talk about the different ways to be able to earn passive income, different ways to be able to earn a, a type of yield that exists in crypto is unprecedented. There's nothing like this in traditional finance, literally nothing. Um, and this is extremely unique to something like crypto. This is extraordinary. Keep going with you're going, Nick. This is brilliant. Yeah, no, uh, we're flattered. It, it's definitely an innovation that doesn't exist today. Um, we were, as we were trying to figure out, you know, a way to incentivize staking, we, we just thought that it was so strange, right? Like where, where does the second layer um, of rewards like come from? And, what really makes so much sense about bringing it in from rebase is, is that it's replenishing the cascade specifically as adoption is occurring. So as we talked about, like in that formative period where a lot of rebases might happen, as those rebases are happening, and depending on the magnitude of those rebases, that's then determining the magnitude of the cascade replenishment, which by the way, we're calling splashes. So whenever the cascade, whenever a rebase happens, a small splash is going to go into the cascade, which is what's going to basically create that incentive and that reward for the cascade liquidity providers. But what to me is really genius about this is that eventually once the, you know, kind of rampant rebasing cycle stops and we reach a point of stability, that cascade becomes a little less attractive, right? There's not going to be that many rewards in the pool, but that's fine 
because at that point we'll be in a much more highly liquid environment. So the cascade just kind of like it's this perfectly logical programmatic way to reward the people who stake early on, but then as adoption starts to occur, the cascade rewards diminish and we just reach that stable peg, which is the ultimate target. Yes, but so, the, wait, wait, wait. But here's what here's what I like about this. This is see, in crypto, everybody's trying to get rich quick, and it's funny because they think if you don't make you know two hundred percent a year, you're 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 going broke. But that's yeah. that's that's coming from people who have not went been through enough investing cycles to see what this is really like. What I like about this that's so powerful long term, if base works. Now we're assuming that we get to the past those early adoption stages where you know it's it's less volatile. If base works as intended, if this project is successful sometime over the next six months or the next six years, whatever it takes, then all of a sudden, not only are you hold, God knows this is brilliant. Not only are you holding a token that can basically mirror the market cap if you believe in the long-term market price of cryptocurrency in general, not only are you holding that token, but now you're doing it in a way that you're also earning some level of interest on that, whether it's 2% a year or 12% a year or 5% a year. Now you're, so it's, 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 you're almost on, on some level is of course, when you the tokens and it's on the smart contract. So it's not necessarily like you're holding the keys, but you, the hope is it's a verifiable, solid, smart contract. And it's still going to be almost as safe as if you were holding the token on your own wallet. Now you have a way to hold that token in a decentralized way and earn a level of interest on it. That's brilliant. Right. Uh, you know, I actually like the way you frame it there because I, I haven't thought about it so much with the way you worded it, but uh, that almost makes me think that it's almost as though you could hold the S&P 500, but on top of just holding it, you could somehow engage with it and provide value for the S&P 500 in a way that the S&P 500 is not just, you know, giving you profits on its own price action, but also a yield on your engagement with it if there this, was some way to provide s p 500 yeah, liquidity yeah. but bro th you, th yeah. this changes this changes finance like this is like my i literally got goosebumps right now and i because i hadn't again i hadn't thought about this part of the whole profit I, literally this changes finance here's the problem with holding i'm i'm a, i'm a big fan of dividend stocks why but a because they're it's hard for them to cook the books they got to pay out a dividend but the other reason is because you get something for your holdings in the world of real estate I like investment property. Why? Because I don't have to worry about buying and flipping, timing a market and fixing it. Once I own a property, I fix it. It's my golden goose that keeps laying the gold neck. I mean, I, I'm freaking using the crypto tab browser right now. Why? Because I make five bucks a month probably. But why do I use it? Because it's I'm, I'm earning some cryptocurrency for doing something that I'm already going to do anyway. It doesn't matter. So, so much about what I do is finding another way to create an income stream without having to worry about time in a market. So if th this is sort of the thing, so, okay, let me, let me try, try to do this in real, in real estate. So there's the real estate investor who's going to go out there and he's going to buy the, the, the property in an emerging market and he's looking to try to flip it. That's great. As long as you can always find those opportunities, but those opportunities don't always, aren't always there and they're inconsistent. The only place that you find opportunities that plentiful for in all the books that you read to tell you how to do it. So the, uh, the, the the idea behind it's the truth the the idea <laughs> the, the but but when you buy for example um say a, a small three bedroom two bathroom house for example and just trying to use basic real estate and it's a a good small home that provides good rent you try to hold that thing for decades if you can same thing with certain dividend stocks certain dividend stocks your dividend aristocrats have been paying out a consistent dividend for 25 plus years a consistent rising dividend for 25 plus years that's a phenomenal group of stocks to own in most cases. Um, and the best thing about it is over time, not only are you able to compound your position through dividends, but you're getting something back for it. This has not been made possible anywhere in crypto to this extent in this way. So much, so many times in crypto, your high yield or your yields are not um, sustainable. And most people don't realize that right. they're, they're just not. I mean, people can pay you tokens all day long. For example, crypto.com can pay you tokens. Why do they just cut from 16% to 6%? Because they're going to run out of tokens at some point. They got, they got to do that with this elastic supply thing. And the, the other thing that's so ingenious about it is you, someone is holding those tokens, but it's your stakers. You're rewarding the people who are currently most likely going to be a longer term holder than someone who's just dropping it, which is, 
fascinating. The, the, this whole thing is very, very interesting. Sorry, the, you just got me. I mean, I don't know if you even understand. Like, this is the kind of thing that would go in a crypto retirement account. Like this is this is like if you could hold crypto and you can't you can hold crypto, ladies and gentlemen, but you can't hold a smart contract probably yet. But at some point in the future, this is the kind of thing that you could put in. I mean, assuming, ladies and gentlemen, I get excited and I get ahead of myself. So understand, we're assuming the code's going to be audited. It's going to be hack proof. There's not going to be any issues with the project. Yada yada yada. Nothing's going to ever happen with Chainlink. We're just making those assumptions. But with time and trust. Because with time comes trust. A year, two years, three years, this thing seems solid. Five years, crypto starting to become mass adopted. No problems with the project. It's just running along. It's efficient. This is the kind of thing that long term you could hold if you believe in the future of cryptocurrency and not have to sell like you're not have to feel like you're selling your original value. So to speak. even though your supply is getting elastic, I get that. It's just, oh, damn, dude, it's just smart. This is really good. You guys are onto something here. No, I mean, I, <clears throat> I've got a good handful of, of things that I do outside of crypto, but obviously I've been engaged with crypto for a while. I've worked on a couple projects, consulted with a couple projects, but um, I was kind of burnt out after uh, some of the bear stuff of 2018 and 2019 in terms of my direct involvement. But as I kind of saw what was going on in DeFi, um, I saw what ha happened with Ampleforth and, you know, the idea of rebase. I thought it was interesting, but I really wasn't sitting there thinking, you know, oh, what, what kind of idea can we come up with? I was really just kind of having a conversation with uh, my co-founder Dylan about it. We were thinking, man, so you can, this is an interesting concept, right? You can create a token which relates to the value of something else, right? Just a synthetic asset using this elastic supply thing. What would really be a, a good use case for that? And, you know, we were kind of thinking about it and realized there's no crypto index product. I mean, there's nothing. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we had to restart the recording there, but go ahead and finish what you were saying. There's been no other, there's not, you were saying there's not ever been another index-based crypto product. Right. There's, there's no real core um, overall industry crypto index. And we thought that that could really be, frankly, a more compelling use case than what Ampleforth did. And I'm not coming for their neck. I've got a lot of respect and reverence for Ampleforth. They were the trailblazers, you know, with this technology, but uh, it, it's just a use case that, made so much sense. I mean, we were just so excited about it alone that we just got to work and it was a lot of sleepless nights and, you know, we got everything together and now we've got a community that's clearly enthusiastic about it. And the most important thing, you know, I, I am an entrepreneur and I don't pursue anything without doing just research, right? Customer research, user research. And in this case, everyone we talked to, I'm talking about people outside of crypto, were like, yeah, that's amazing. That, that, that That's perfect, right? Because whether you're in the crypto industry and you want to use this to diversify or hedge your positions or you're a crypto outsider, you know you want to engage with crypto, but you don't know which tokens to buy because it's all too confusing. This is the simplest really proposal ever. It's just here's the one cryptocurrency that represents all of the cryptocurrencies. And so for that reason, we just we really had to run with it. No, it's yeah, but I, I mean, it's so much even it's so much bigger than that. I, I think it's so cute that you're like, oh, you know, this is such a neat idea. No one's ever done it. No, this is so much bigger than that. And I'm realizing it even more. I already saw it was a long term hold in the event that you wanted to once it's proven. Ladies and gentlemen, understand the rebasing is not yet a truly proven model. And before it looks like they're kind of proving it. So I'm not I don't want to oversell this. I'm selling the vision of what it could become. It is not going to be that on launch. Understand that. But this kind of thing, should it continue to prove to rebasing works the way that we expect it to work, the way that we think it's going to work, if that happens, then, and this cascades thing you're talking about, being able to stake it like that, and, and it's amazing because you're actually, I just realized something else. You're earning from two ways, right? You're earning from the liquidity pool of Uniswap, but then you're simultaneously earning your, these, I mean, God, man, like this is like, for someone, okay, there's a self-directed investor out there, right? You got the guy who wants to, you know, buy a mutual fund. Then you got the self-directed investor. Like this destroys basically the grayscales of the world, for lack of better terms. Like this destroys the 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 man. Like why would you need them when this works? It like, decentralizes the grayscales. Decentralizing. That's, the, that's the right word. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Decentralize, which is why it might be illegal one day. I didn't say that. But anyway, um, <laughs> everybody wants to protect their industry. Everybody wants to protect their industry. They're all trying to protect their paycheck. When they're protecting their paycheck, they're taking money out of your pocket. Um, but this is this is this is brilliant. Like this idea. So I, I gotta ask. Okay, I want to back up. I, I appreciate you going back to. I want to talk a little bit about. Oh wait, uh, I'm sorry. I got I gotta wrap up one point here. The yeah, whole point ahead. of me talking about the cascade. You were talking about audit. 
the token contract is audited. Uh, the cascade is a separate contract, which is going to be audited, and um, that that report's going to be released before token listing. So that that audit's happening right now and will be completed, and the cascade will be ready at token listing. So the token contract is audited and done, and then the audit for the cascade is pending. Would that be listed somewhere on your website at some point? Uh, the report? Yeah, the report of the audit. Yeah, yeah, okay. 100%. Okay, we'll and, and, and also, ladies and gentlemen, you can go the, and you can reach out to Nick. I mean, you can reach out to whoever in the community as well on uh, Telegram. It's a great community. And by the way, if you're in crypto and you're not on Telegram, like there's literally no better place to find out what's going on with your projects. N none at all. Um, either you're going to talk to an admin or you're going to talk to a dev. And if you're talking to an admin, they're talking to a dev. So it's by far you have to be on Telegram. Um, so l let me, okay, I want to... I was going to wrap up with one. I had one more question I want to ask you, and I can't think of it right now related directly to the project. Oh, um, and this is going to be the toughest question I've asked you probably, and I'm just going to be blunt because I always want to know this. Outside of being an early investor in the project, where's your profit for potential? Or where's your, if any, ongoing incentive to stay involved with the project? That's either good or bad. But I'm just meaning people look at this as either a good thing or a bad thing. I just want to know what is your profit potential? How does it work? Are you making some sort of fee through transactions or however that works? Yeah, so I'll start with uh, team token allocation. It is a little over 9% allocated for team. That is completely locked for a year and then vested linearly <clears throat> for a year. What does that mean? So a team doesn't... Um, so the tokens are completely locked for a year. We have no access to them. And then once that year is over... Those tokens will get unlocked at a rate of 8.33% once a month for the following year. So the team doesn't really get all of its tokens until two years out. We just, you know, we're, we're partnered with a community back VC DuckDAO. And um, I, I'm, not, I'm not too familiar, or I, at least I wasn't too familiar with all the kind of rug pulling stuff that was going on in the DeFi space lately. Um, but they told us, like, yeah, it's a it's a huge problem right now, and people really want to see that they can trust that a team is long term committed, and that was no problem for us because again, that that's really where we're seeing, um, I guess, the incentive for us as a team is is in our team token to do to, to do well, not on a one month or two month flip, but in the long run where we really kind of see this core mission we have that base becomes a crypto index. So uh, that just to give you guys an idea, there is team token allocation but it is locked invested. And then to answer your, your question, total team right, token did, wait, 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 total <clears throat> team token allocation is 9%. Yeah. That's nothing. Okay. Keep going. And so, uh, the, the other point I want to mention, so remember we were talking about the cascade Yes. and how whenever there's like a 20% supply expansion, extra 2% gets minted. And I said, it mostly goes into the cascade right. through a splash. So 80% of it goes to the cascade. And 20% of it goes to the base dev pool. Okay. And that's basically how we're going to be supporting development over the course of, of the project. Now, again, the other thing that's really cool about that, and I talked about it with the Cascade too, is that that dev pool is only being capitalized during positive, during positive rebases, right? right? So as the project is doing well and holders are happy because, um, you know, they're seeing successful adoption, new adoption is occurring... As that adoption occurs, we can logically conclude that, that there could be a need for more development in that case, that we're going to want to be able to build on that. So the dev pool gets replenished in that situation so that we can fund development to further build on that adoption. However, again, to my point that I was mentioning earlier, eventually when those rebases slow down and adoption is calmed, the dev pool does not get replenished anymore. So it's basically a perfectly programmatic way, a transparent programmatic way to support base development that only occurs when positive adoption happens. If theoretically base is released on listing and no one adopts, no one comes in, people just aren't interested in this use case and there are no positive rebases, the dev pool gets nothing. When there's a negative rebase, the dev pool gets nothing. It's only in the case of a positive rebase. What are you calling so, a positive rebase? Or maybe I'm, I'm sorry, not what? maybe I'm not understanding a positive rebase. What do you what's a positive rebase as opposed to a negative one? a supply expansion. Okay. So if price is trading above what it's supposed to and we expand supply oh, duh. So, and okay. the protocol expands but yeah that's what we call a positive rebase. Makes and sense. It has to contract yep. supply a negative rebase. I got it. Makes sense. Okay. 
Uh, for some reason, I don't know. My brain wasn't seeing it that way. So I'm glad you, I'm certain someone else needed to hear that I as thought. well. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, yeah. so far, if you're excited by the potential of this project, or if it at least sounds fascinating, I'm not telling you to be an investor in this space. On my channel, I'm never, understand, I'm never asking you to be an investor. I'm here for awareness. But if this sounds as fascinating to you as it sounds to me, go down to the comments and tell me. Just just be like, base protocol to the future. That's all I wanted you to type, base protocol to the future. So yeah. I appreciate you explaining that. So it's, and I want to make sure I understand it just because, and that makes so much sense too, by the way, because ladies and gentlemen, you always want your devs to somehow be, there. In theory, in most cases, you're going to want them. Listen, there's a lot of people that can do something because they have a cause or passionate about it, but you can't expect them to be here for the next five years, 10 years, potentially 20 years, just because they're supposed to stay passionate about the project they created. I love how people are like, oh, it's a smart contract. It can never end. Sure, it can never end, except nobody will use it. Um, so the, then it's irrelevant. So I want to ask you this real quick. I want to make sure I'm understanding this real quick. So on a positive rebase, let's just say that there's a, a hypothetical 100% expansion, just to be, well, Anyway, 100% of the rebase, let's use, use that, whatever that number is. 50% obviously goes, is basically going to everybody else. And then 50% is going to the cascade, or is it 20% going no. to the cascade? No, if there's a 100% rebase, uh -huh. that means 100% new tokens are created. An extra 10% is created. So technically, it'd be a 110% supply expansion. Gotcha. Among that 10%, 8% of it is going to the cascade and 2% would go to the dev pool. Gotcha. So 20% of whatever goes in the cascade, but in the cascade, I did not, okay, I missed that too. So your rebase is always basically going to be 10% more and that 10% more is going towards the cascade of which 2% goes to the dev pool. Exactly. And I should also mention that in the case of a negative rebase, we actually exempt the burning of 10% of the token. So in the same way that uh, the protocol mints an extra 10% of the rebase, in case of a negative rebase, right, a supply contraction, it exempts the destruction of 10% of tokens. But in that case, the dev pool is not replenished. The full 10% goes straight to Cascade. So whether it's a positive rebase or a negative rebase, the Cascade is getting replenished. I don't understand that. Explain that second part again about, yeah, the, so, about the negative rebasing. So let's say that there's going to be a 20% supply contraction. So let's say there's 100% of tokens in the ecosystem and 20 tokens are going to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. In that case, instead of actually destroying 20 tokens, it would destroy 18 tokens. Mm -hmm. And two of those tokens, right, would then go into the cascade. So, oh, wait a minute. Wow, that's interesting. So the way you keep the cascade filled. So basically, you're going to destroy tokens for the general market out there. It, essentially, my wallet, your wallet, everybody's wallet, whatever, the, the supply on Uniswap, whatever, the, the, those tokens are destroyed to shrink the supply. But 2% essentially are pulled out of the market, but they're sort of locked into the cascade. That's how you they get They go away straight with into the cascade, straight into the ecosystem. And devs, don't, like get, it's, and devs don't get anything. Okay. Devs I, don't get anything on a negative rebase. Hey, I'll no. give you a shout out. That's really, that's really a kind of fair way to do that. In fact, I think it's unnecessarily fair like you don't know, the, quite the thing that and the, the thing that's cool about it is that the, the way that we saw it is like you know the, it makes the most sense that the dev pool is capitalized or funded um on positive rebases because yes. that's where everybody's winning and there's going to be a greater need for development and stuff i can make the case there's a need for development on negative rebases but i think that it's just a lot more fair that that we do it just on positive rebases but what i also really like about it is that you know, like I was saying, there's going to be, in the case of a supply expansion, 10% of that expansion is going to be minted in extra, and then 8% would go to Cascade, 2% goes to the dev pool. But in the and, and that's to incentivize, as adoption is happening, incentivize staking. But in the case of a supply contraction, like I said, 10% is exempted, and a full 10% goes to the Cascade, rather than just 8%. Because technically, in the, in the situation of a negative rebase, we really want to even further incentivize and further reward the stakers who are still committed, right? Yes, absolutely. So, actually, so you're, it, the cascade is getting replenished at positive and negative rebases, and technically a little bit more at negative rebases. Nick, th this is the more I talk to you and, and hear these tokenomics broken down like this, like th like this is genius. Like, honest to God, like with. Huh. 
listen, I'm going to give a shout out to Richard Hart and I'm a small investor in Hex and I, I'm very critical of that, of his project. And I think he's really smart, but one thing I'll give him credit for was he really thought that project through a lot. Um, and I gave him credit for that, just the thinking it through Now, who knows whether it works long term, but give him credit for thinking it through. You guys put a lot of thought in this. This is really the tokenomics on this literally are, are one of the neatest things that I've seen in a long time so far. Like this is really, wow. I'm really glad. I mean, when we started this interview, ladies and gentlemen, I didn't fully understand this part of it. Um, and this is brilliant. Like this is because here's the thing that people aren't going to always understand when you see, when you see a negative rebase, like there's gotta be an incentive and as stakers essentially are locking up tokens. They're creating an artificial limited supply, which helps push the price back up when other people are whatever interacting or whatever. Um, and and you want those people to stay there. So in some ways, it's more profitable on a negative rebase to be a staker than it is on a, meaning it's more profitable based on rewards, I guess. I don't know how to say that. Um, the, rewards percentage. Yeah, there, there's an interesting there's an interesting dynamic where in the cascade, you're, you're profited a little bit better on the, which is the time when a lot of people may be unstaking. Like a lot of people might unstake on those negative rebases after a while. They're like, oh, it's dropping. It's not going to, you know, it's not going to, peg properly etc cetera, etc cetera. um this is this is interesting this is really interesting yeah and and i i gotta say you've asked all the right questions all the best questions for us to get into this the more i guess interesting deep dive on base protocol we can talk about the things that i really want to talk about it's been a good it's been a good it's been a good talk yeah this is bad i want to spend a few minutes if you don't mind i want to talk about I want to talk about who you are because I think it's important for people to recognize who's behind the project and, and who Dylan is. And I don't know Dylan, obviously. And, and, and I'm not mm. trying to ask like personal details, but who are these two guys that create this? Where do you come from? How long have you been in crypto? Like, like, oh, let me just ask you point blank. When did you first hear about cryptocurrency? First heard about it, 2013. Okay. Uh, first bought cryptocurrency. I mean, really transacted cryptocurrency. Uh, or middle, I mean, really 2017 write about the the entire Ethereum wave. I mean, I, I've always known about crypto. I've been a big supporter of crypto. Um, however, never really like engaged too much uh, myself. I just kind of like watched from the sidelines. And I always understood the, the, the Bitcoin thesis and I always loved it. But um, I didn't so much engage until I saw Ethereum. When I saw Ethereum, I mean, I, you know, I just couldn't sleep. I, I was like, wow, this is this is really really going to change things this is really interesting and i started engaging with um the entire kind of dap world i thought that there was a lot of cool applications there and i had a lot of friends who were involved in cryptocurrency dylan um has been an, a cryptocurrency investor since like 2013 i think um and then everyone else on our team our, our other two uh developers uh chris for a while i think he got involved around 2016 and then uh mcgee um who's our other developer He's a, he's a 2013 guy as well, I think. All right. Honest question. Were you in BitConnect? No. Liar. You know, <laughs> you all were in BitConnect. Everybody was like, <laughs> I always think about that. I'm like, come on. And these guys talking like, you were in BitConnect. You know you were. Um, and the only reason I say that is because that shit didn't go that high without a bunch of people in it. Um, so... <laughs> So yeah. what, what's been your, what's been the, your favorite investment and it's okay if it's Bitcoin or Ethereum, but like, what's been your favorite investment in the crypto space? Chainlink. Really? I, I, I don't know what the, what the word is on the street about, um, oracles. I know, I know a lot of people for whatever reason are divided about it. And I guess it's not even so much about Chainlink specifically as it is about oracles for me. I think that oracles are really cool and are really going to have a big impact uh, kind of in the cryptocurrency space and on the world. How about you? For me, my favorite? Yeah. Uh, probably Bitcoin without question. I believe the number one use case, I believe programmable money is the second best use case. I think currency and that whole, what you said, the Bitcoin thesis. I think that is- My mind, when you asked that, my mind went to altcoins for some reason. For my sure, mind went sure. to what kind of interest in- you know, stuff are you playing with? Um, okay. Keeping an eye on. Yeah. yeah for, I'm a Bitcoin maximalist. Oh, are you really? That's interesting. Yeah. But you're an Ethereum developer. Well, you're in the Ethereum space, but you're a Bitcoin maximalist. You can't be a Bitcoin. That's not what you mean. You mean you're mostly a Bitcoin maximalist. That has to be what you mean. Sure. Uh, yeah. Because uh, I'm, I'm probably. I see the value in both. 
so let me think. So do, what do you think would rival Bitcoin? Do you think there's, do you think there could, I had a, so I just did a video and, and it'd be up before this one. I just did a video. In fact, it's going up tonight, but I just did a video where I said the, um, I talked about the best, the best way to know a bull run uh, is coming. The best indicator. Do you know what it is by chance? I'll save you. It's the family friend <laughs> indicator. When they call you asking yeah. about Bitcoin. I just had it happen yesterday morning. I had a financial advisor, very successful guy, makes hundreds of thousands of dollars. In fact, just turned out an offer for a million dollar bonus to go to JP Morgan. He called me yesterday morning and said, hey, talk, and, and I think what happened was he was reading an article about blockchain and elections, which is crazy because I was like, I just did a video about this dude. But he said, so tell me, what is it you know about crypto? He was asking all these usual questions, right? Like, who do you think was behind it? Do you think the NSA created it? Why do you think it's going to go up? How high right. do you think it's going to go? Et cetera, et cetera. And he kind of got it because he's a precious metals guy too. Uh, fun fact, it's illegal. And if I said his company name, it's a major company. Like they probably produce more credit card and debit cards than anybody else. Um, and he told me it's illegal for his, not illegal, that's the wrong word. It's uh, against his company policy for him to buy crypto. Isn't that wow. interesting? He said, he said, he said, by regulation, I have to let every like I have to I have to disclose all my stock purchases and sales, but my company is against their policy as an employee for me to buy cryptocurrency. Isn't that interesting? Um, I thought, wow, they don't want competition, man. That's what it is. They don't want them talking about it. <laughs> um, hmm. So the uh, th another question. Sorry, I don't know where we're going with that. But another question I want to ask you is, um, what is in, in the perfect world, oh, I know what I was going to ask you. Do you see anything overtaking Bitcoin? Do you see another? Because one of his questions was, is there another currency that could take over Bitcoin? I said, look, Litecoin's already faster. You know, you can make an argument for something like Digibyte. But I come from a marketing background. There, There's nothing. I, I, I think it's going to be hard-pressed to get beyond the trust of Bitcoin. What are your thoughts? I, I tend to agree. Um, there is just the first mover variable there, but also I think that it's gold. I, I mean, uh, I, I guess I just kind of go off gut, but overall, um, I, I don't know what I could, you know, it's an interesting question. It, it is an interesting question because I don't know what I would really say to substantiate it, but I just feel like, I mean, I was so compelled by Bitcoin and its narrative and, I mean, just going on, what we've seen historically from the inception of cryptocurrency, which was Bitcoin to this moment today, right? Mm -hmm. Bitcoin is, um, it's, it's cryptocurrency's champion. I don't, I don't know what it would take for, you know, because like you mentioned, I mean, there are other cryptocurrencies that are technically more functional in, in several aspects, but it, it, it hasn't, I mean, I don't think there's ever going to be a flippening or anything. I, I really you don't, don't think there's ever going to be a flippening. That's your, that's your belief. I never thought about it. No, I haven't thought hard about it. Um, I, if I had to make, a, you know, I, if I had to say, what's more likely, will there ever be a flippening of Bitcoin over between now and infinity, or will Bitcoin be it forever? I guess I'd have to say there's probably going to be a flippening. Okay. I, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, look, I think. All right. So we were talking about the flipping. Ladies and gentlemen, th this interview is like forcing me to have to clean up the spare space on my hard drive. So we're talking about the, the, the flipping and will it happen? And, you know, I, I, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. But here's my thing. Here's what I like about your project. So and this is one of the things I was thinking about in the back of my mind. So when would base something like base protocol provided it's proven to work and I, no disrespect to your project. We have no idea yet. Provided right. it's proven to work. What a very interesting form of diversification for some percentage of your crypto portfolio. Like if there's a flipping, you're still going to benefit from it. My dude just burped on camera. But if you uh, there's going to there's going to be a flipping, you know. So that's I just find that very very interesting. When we were just off camera for a minute, you said you wanted to to bring up another use case for uh, base token or base protocol. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, you know we've talked about base as a crypto index, which is really the primary use case. But uh, there are more use cases than just that. So here, I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen real quick to, yeah. to show you guys the website. You guys can obviously check this out on your own at baseprotocol.org. But um, so here we have the crypto index use case. Um, there are three others that I really talk about on the website and more that people can probably spin up in the future. And, you know, different platforms can build on base. But 
here's some core ones that we really thought about. So base is going to be really interesting as a collateral asset. So let me explain that to you. Imagine that you wanted to borrow to then go and make a cryptocurrency investment. You've got some altcoin basket that, that you think is going to perform really well. Like a crypto loan. You're trying to take some sort yeah, of loan. Yeah, okay. exactly. So you take a loan out for base, right? Take a loan out for a thousand base, and then you go and buy your crypto strategy, your altcoins. And let's say that crypto markets took a tank, right, of like 40% and your strategy is down 60% because you bought these aggressive, you know, altcoin assets. Now you have to go back eventually and return that base to the lender. But when you go and return that base to the lender, you notice the value of the base actually went down correspondent to the market. It went down 40%. So you're only exposed to the loss you took that was in excess of the market. So now instead of having a 60% loss, you are only exposed to the 20% loss the difference between your strategy and the overall market. And same for the vice versa, right? You borrowed 1,000 base, crypto markets went up, you know, 20% and your portfolio went up 35%, you would get exposure to that 15%, right? When you go and return the base, you are basically just giving yourself exposure to your performance that was in excess of crypto market performance. This is going to be a really valuable hedging tool for people who want to trade on leverage. I'm not following you. Know, you. It sounds like Wait a minute. I'm not following you. Here's why. What mm -hmm. is base priced in when I'm taking that loan? It doesn't, there's, the, the lender is still taking a loss. So what is base priced in when I'm taking that loan? If base is at like 40 cents, for example, um, at the time of, of, of you taking out the loan, Right. And then you go and uh, buy your crypto strategy, whatever happens, and let's say crypto market falls down to $300 billion. Now your token should be worth $0.30. Cents. Again, this is in the perfect world where price is pegged perfectly. Right, All right. things held equal. Let's assume there's no rebases. Now your tokens are worth $0.30 cents Wait a minute, instead. pause, so, pause, pause. There's always going to be rebases. Let's assume the rebases are minor or small. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Let's assume that the rebases are small. So in general... Right, we saw a crypto market cap go from 400 billion to 300 billion. Therefore, the value of your tokens went from 40 cents to 30 cents, or maybe 29 cents or 31 cents. Right. Right. So, because it is correlated with the crypto market cap, it kind of hedges your bet. The, the easiest way I can explain this. No, is, that you know, guys. Make, yeah, wait, sorry, that doesn't make sense, though. Uh, sorry, but that is not making sense. And here's where I'm losing you. If I'm a lender, I don't. I don't care how the number of base I give you. All I care about is the value of that when I get it back. If I'm a lender, I don't want a thousand, a hundred pennies. I don't want fifty pennies when I gave you a hundred. Like that doesn't matter. That do you know what I'm saying? I need that value back in somehow. Right, and 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 that's where you have well, and that's where you have lenders who have different risk appetites. Right. To this day, there are people who are lending Bitcoin, and. They want their one Bitcoin back. Right. Whether that Bitcoin comes back as ten thousand or twenty thousand okay. dollars, it is how it's denominated. You're, now this is minute, why wait Bitcoin's you're been talking about, Wait a minute. I'm I'm thinking early stage. You're talking about later stages when there's stability and base and the pegging and Absolutely. Gotcha. When someone's like, Hey, I want so when I asked you earlier what's the value correlated at, the value is correlated at the market cap. And I'm willing to give you a loan against the market cap and I want you to pay me back and the Okay. Okay, that's brilliant. Keep going where you're going with it, that. It is contingent on right the the perfect utility where it's pegged. Yeah. This is this is a late stage use case, right? We have to see a really good correlation with crypto market cap before this use case is met. While it's trading, uh, while price is volatile and this and the peg isn't stable, this use case isn't very relevant. But once that peg becomes stable, this use case becomes big. And there's platforms like Aave that already support use cases like this. Right, right. Another use case is just basically as a safe haven. You know, it's kind of goes along with the crypto index use case, but it's a little different. When people trade, um, you know, their altcoin strategies, they might trade, they might uh, profit, they might take a loss, but usually when they pull out, sure, they might kill all their exposure. They might go into Tether, but a lot of times they go into Bitcoin, so they still have that blue chip exposure to the crypto industry. I think that base can actually be a very attractive alternative as your safe haven between your trades, right? Your transitory position. So you're still maintaining exposure to the crypto industry, but with a lot more coverage than you would have with just Bitcoin. Brilliant. Right? Yep. Last uh, kind of use case is 
base is a price basis. I don't oh, really know exactly how to, how, to, how to word this. Yeah. So the idea is that um, you've got, say, Ethereum, and you want to look at Ethereum, the Ethereum to USD pair, right? ETH to USD. That's showing you how Ethereum performs against the dollar. You know, who cares? What's more interesting is the ETH to BTC chart because that's showing you how ETH is performing against Bitcoin. And that's really important because as you evaluate your speculation on ETH, you really want to know how it did because alternatively you could have been holding Bitcoin, which is kind of your industry standard, right? Well, this is brilliant. So the, ETH, the ETH to BTC chart is showing you how ETH performs against just Bitcoin. But we think that base could be a really valuable price basis because now instead of looking at ETH as it related to USD or ETH as it related to Bitcoin, you get to look at ETH as it related to the entire crypto market. Ladies and gentlemen, this, this is, is extraordinary. Wait, really wait this is extraordinary. Yeah. The average newish investor out there, myself included, by the way, does not compare their current holdings on the overall market, meaning some people are familiar with Bitcoin dominance. This is essentially Bitcoin dominance in a trading pair. If you're holding Bitcoin or it's Ethereum dominance or it's Chainlink exactly. dominance. This is exactly that's actually really yeah. fascinating. Like it would be interesting. Listen, if this gets exchanged, if this is on any exchange, Uniswap, whatever. Do you know how fascinating it is to go look at your position and be like, how does it compare to base? Like that's freaking brilliant. And this has never been with all due respect, Nick. I'm not so certain that you understand the full gravity of this. <laughs> because <laughs> you're sitting there talking about the flipping thing. i'm like yeah base might flip <laughs> because the reason i say that is because it's not going to do it as long as bitcoin dominance is through the roof or whatever and and by the way i'm, I'm mostly bitcoin maximalist as well but who doesn't want to who doesn't want to have some exposure to the altcoins as well who doesn't want to have some exposure to that side of the market as well this is really interesting so ladies and gentlemen let's talk about some ways to profit really quickly let's wrap it up with that some of them we've talked on briefly but one is the obvious one. It's a buy and hold. Now, it's not going to be... A, well, let me back up. One is speculation. Get in early because you expect prices maybe appreciate or get in early because coin, uh, crypto hasn't hit mass adoption yet. So one is, is kind of an early stage opportunity, right? The other opportunity is going to be um, is going to be the, the rebasing, particularly early on. That's always going to be an opportunity. The, the, the reason that works, the thing that blew my mind that I didn't understand about rebase tokens, and I'm going to want to say this, is you're encouraged to arbitrage price. That You need to arbitrage price for it to work properly. That's the only reason it right. works. So arbitraging sometimes is seen like this sort of, you know, I don't know. I was telling Nick before we started, it's almost like a gray zone, like you're secretly arbitraging and you can't tell nobody. No, everyone needs to know. That's why there's a, a dashboard that's going to show you the rebasing and understand how it works. If there's a 10% rebase, you essentially, once the rebase is done, you have a value that's going to be 10% more or whatever. Like that's going to be an instant value. Now, over time, it's going to change quickly. You're not going to get a chance to trade it because the whales are going to be trading. A lot of other people will be trading and it's going to Hopefully, the idea, the hope is that it pegs really close to price really quick and it doesn't have these long swings. But in the early stages, whatever that's a few weeks or a few months or a few years, depending, because here's where you're going to see, okay, here's where you're going to see inefficiency of markets. When, when you, anytime you see a sudden amount of people coming into base, anytime that you see a lot more people coming in than has currently been in, which is going to happen early on and may happen at some stage later towards mass adoption of this project. Um, anytime you see a lot more players in the space or a lot more capital coming in, you may see some inefficiency in price at that point for until it settles back down. Am I wrong on that, Nick? I don't want to speculate on that, but that is the behavior we've seen with other rebase tokens. Wait, 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 wait. Understand what I'm saying and what I'm not saying. I'm not telling you to tell people this is how they're going to make money, but you're going to make money off of speculation. That's the bottom line. You're going to make money off of inefficiency in the market. So we're going to see more inefficiency if something like that occurs, correct? There, Yes, there will be inefficiency windows. Yeah, and, absolutely. And that's what's going to happen. So you, you can, you, your opportunity to be able to make money is, here's the thing I like about it the most. In a few weeks after launch, you're going to see, is it working? Like, are people actually buying and selling it? Once people are buying or selling it, this isn't something that's going to go to zero, unless somehow the smart contract just totally fucks <laughs> like, like it's not going to go to zero in like in theory, someone's going to be buying it up because the rebasing is going to be taking place. So as long as there's 
liquidity. As long as there's users, it's just not going to zero. So we'll know that after a few weeks of people start using it. That's what makes it extraordinary as well. This is not a, a random rug pull that can happen per se. Um, in any way that I can see, as long as there's enough liquidity and enough users. Am I right or wrong on that? Nick? Right. There's not, this isn't a, I mean, the easiest way I can put it is this isn't a business. doesn't require clients. doesn't require revenues. Uh, we could, there's not going to be a rug pull, but if everyone on our team died, uh, people in the community can still call the rebates to happen. It's decentralized. It, it all occurs through the contract. So, um, no, this thing just sort of lives on its own. Totally. Totally. So one is get in early, like the IPO stage, so to speak, or the get in while the coin market cap is still small. What is your, how does someone, can someone buy base today right now? I know you guys did the whole duck down thing, but outside of that, we have a, the tokenomics are public on our website. Um, we've got a small community lottery round where users will be able to come in. There's 50,000 in base allocated towards that. It's extremely oversubscribed right now, but that's why we're doing a lottery round. So everyone has a fair chance to get in. You can apply for that on our website, uh, on the base protocol, um, there. presale Token form. Sale. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so we'll, we'll do some follow up on that. But, uh, other than that, the lion's share of the token sale is mostly just for kind of strategic private buyers, um, people who are long-term committed, all those tokens are vested anywhere between three to four to 12 months, um, you know, for the seed round. So, and the seed round's tiny. Um, it's a, it's a decent discount, but it's nothing, it's not like a hundred X discount or anything. It's not even a 50% discount, but uh, that's all vested over 12 months. So anyway, point that I'm getting at is we um, weren't just looking to bring in, I guess, whatever money we could bring in. We really wanted the more smart money, the committed money. And so we are partnered with a couple different uh, big funds that I can't disclose at the moment, but we probably will uh, later on this month. And uh, obviously DuckDAO, the community-backed VC, you know, they're really awesome. Um, but in terms of just people watching this, I, I do encourage you to, to apply on the pre-sale form. And if you are someone who can kind of provide some strategic value, whether that's um, as a fund, you're someone who's got industry part or industry connections, um, or you represent some you know large community, especially if it's international, you can obviously reach out to us. You can put that in on the pre-sale form, and we'll probably follow up with you and see if you know we can maybe squeeze you in for an allocation. But that's the structure right now. When 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 it, this launches, is the price going to be pegged immediately to the like that? The initial price is going to peg to market cap. You're asking a great question. The if I had to say the biggest weakness with base protocol, like the thing that annoys me the most, it's our initial listing price, right? At, I, I would like to just tell everyone the initial listing price is crypto market cap times you know 0 0.1 to the 12th power because that's what I want it to be. Right. If crypto market cap at the time of our sale is 444 billion, then base price at listing should be 44.4 cents. But that's a little bit hard to market. And so whenever we started this, we talked about a 35 cent price at listing. However, that's probably going to change by the time of listing. So yeah, right now what we've got listed is a 35 cent price. However, um, it's probably going to be a lot closer to what actual crypto market cap is at the time. Correct. And if you get in on that first day when it's listed, and by the way, hang go to telegram you'll know when it's going to get listed so even if you don't get the allocation there's going to be at that point it would be a negative rebase to raise the price is that right uh if we're really not wanting to start with price any lower than uh than yeah but by hypothetically mark if, if okay so you're trying to get the price started at market cap is the goal on yeah. launch day but if you were going to do it, it would be just under market cap is what I was saying. But anyway, okay. So you're, you're planning to try to, uh, well then Nick, stop making this complicated. So the goal is to release it at the price of market cap when that occurs. Okay. And ladies and gentlemen, just so you know, those of us that got a small piece of the pre-sale and, and just so you know, this, this content, this whole video is not sponsored. I, me and Nick connected actually it was crypto Yardy, who's a uh, sub, uh, viewer, one of my earliest subscribers on my entire channel who basically encouraged me to reach out to Nick and vice versa, encouraged Nick to reach out, reach out to me on Twitter. Um, and so we connected after the fact I was already invested in the project. It already looked cool. 
I, I found out about it through Duck Dow. I'll do a whole video about that at some point in the future. But um, th for those of us that are in, it was a risk as well because right now we got in at a discount, but it doesn't mean that if market tanks or something between now and then, then it that might not be such a discount anymore. But um, that was part of, of getting in. He's absolutely right. It wasn't an enormous discount per se. Um, all right, so let me ask you this. I, I want to, and I'll uh, wrap up. We were talking about ways to, to be able to, to, how could this be profitable for someone? One is over you all overall market cap. One is trading on the rebases uh, each day or so on the inefficiencies, and you need to be doing that. One is um, the arbitrage opportunities. You look like you didn't know what I was talking about. No, 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 no. I, I did. I, for a second, I couldn't tell if you were asking a question. No, that's all. I was, yeah, I am. I'm confirming. Am I missing something? So one is yeah. just being buying and holding and investing in it. One is arbi one is uh, arbitrage opportunities. Am I missing? What else is there? The oh, cascade. cascade. Yes, cascade, and of course, compounding. Should you choose to do that or whatever, but the cascade providing liquidity. Ladies and gentlemen, you really should not go to Uniswap to provide liquidity. If you provide liquidity through Cascade, you're essentially providing liquidity to Uniswap. That's correct. Correct. Well, it you're you're right fundamentally. The the the, the way to frame that is, guys, if you are providing base liquidity on Uniswap, you better make sure you're also doing it on the Cascade. Because there's a reward opportunity for you there. Why would I so? Why would I do it through one and not the other? Well, to to stake in the cascade, you have to prove to us that you've staked on Uniswap. Gotcha. So when you stake base on Uniswap, Uniswap returns you a unique liquidity pool token right. that says I'm staking base on Uniswap. Yes. You then stake that with us. That's how we know it's on Uniswap, and that's where the reward pool. That's gotcha. where you're issued the second layer of reward. Thank you for that clarification, because I would have been <laughs> asking in Telegram later. Thank you for that clarification. So if you're staking on Uniswap, don't be an idiot. Make sure you're staking on base. <laughs> 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 All right. Nick, is there anything else you're going to wrap up with? Any the way they need to be able to contact you or any info? I'm going to put the website down in the description. Um, you can check it out there. Um, and on the website, you can access Telegram. You guys are more act active in Telegram, yeah? Yes. And, of course, you have a Twitter as well. Um, mm -hmm. And that will be on the website. Anything else people need to to reach out to you guys or anything they need to be aware of, anything you want to wrap it up with? Nothing else, guys. Just go ahead and engage with us through tele Telegram, through Twitter. Apply uh, on the pre-sale application if you'd like. And I just want to say thanks for the interview. I think it's been great. Um, I really look forward to sharing this video and, and clipping it because I think we've had some some really good discussions here um, about base. This has been awesome. I want to apologize to Nick as I was editing the video. I saw that I cut out again on him. Basically, my hard drive was just filling up. And I need to go through and clean it out a little bit. But I want to say this. I had a phenomenal time talking with him. I learned a lot from him. This is a very interesting product, uh, a project. I encourage you to pay attention to base. Again, we talked about possible ways that people could speculate on this product. But keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, not investment advice. Crypto is risky. New projects are even more risky. This is very fascinating um, at the end of the video, make certain I'm going to post on the end screen the video that he did with box mining. If you want to do your thorough research on the project in general, obviously you've watched this video. Go watch the box mining video as well and make certain that you go hit them up in Telegram. Ask your questions. Hang out with the community. This is going to be a fun project to watch. Even if you're not an investor, I encourage you, let's just watch the project. See where they go. They got some hot, some high goals. Let's see if they're able to accomplish them. Thank you so much for watching. Remember, crypto equals freedom. This is Crypto Wealth. I'm out.